today designing modern board games based on George Philly's forthcoming book, A Class in Board Game Design. Lecture 8. What is a game? Why do people play? Opinions from Greg Kostikian and Glenn Blackow. What I am going to do today is to discuss the second of the essays by Greg Kostikian, the essay where he asks, in essence, what is a game? And this is a sort of a very important question. After all, we're going to say we're designing a game. It would be embarrassing to design something, and you look at it, and there's no game there. And uh, perhaps peculiarly, instead of starting with a formal definition, here is what a game is, here is what is not a game, he begins by saying some things that indicate that an object is not a game. Uh, some of you may have heard of the notion of fuzzy sets. The notion of fuzzy sets as opposed to exact sets is that we have a series of creatures and we would like to know whether this creature is a goose or a swan, or a duck, or a woods duck. And we adopt a description which sort of says the swan, the duck is small, the woods duck is enormously brightly colored and all sorts of, they're gorgeous. The goose is significantly bigger, and if you have ever seen one, swans are huge and should be viewed from a distance as they will attack people and are quite nasty. However, if you actually look at particular creatures if you have some, the, an annoying case as well, mixed in with all of these creatures is a blue goose. And a blue goose is much larger than the Canadian geese you see on Institute Pond. They're loving creatures that mate for life. Uh, they will happily adopt um, any duckling, gosling, or whatever signet that comes along. Uh, they're actually very pleasant creatures from a safe distance. Uh, but if you try to apply the classification, you realize there are issues. And then if you say a swan, well, a swan is white, correct? However, there is an Australian species of swan that has one important technical feature. It is jet black. They're swans. They're clearly the same family. Um, and you ask, what is it? Or if you say, we have a duck, and here is a duck, and it has a certain, if it's a mallard, it has a certain color pattern. Except, color patterns on birds fluctuate. And when I was living in Ann Arbor, there was sitting in, a, in the uh, local river, well, clearly a mallard, except it was bright green everywhere. It was a color variation. Very spectacular color variation. Um, so when you say we are defining things, this is a game, this is not a game, there are surfaces and lines, and there are questions as to what makes something a game or not. So Kostikians tries to rule out things that are really not games. And so he says that something that is a puzzle a story, or a toy is not a game. Of course, he then has to explain what he means by a puzzle. And a traditional example of a puzzle is a jigsaw puzzle. Now, the easy jigsaw puzzles are the, oh, 1950s, 1970s. They're cut out, the pieces interlock, the color patterns overlap, and there is only one solution which you can eventually find. Of course, sometimes the interlocks are almost identical, the colors are almost identical, and you can generate extremely hard puzzles simply by making the pieces almost the same. If you want a really hard jigsaw puzzle, though, you go back to the 19th century. The jigsaw puzzles of the 19th century were actually cut out of wood with a jigsaw. There was no color overlap. So here is a color, and there is a color, and they don't overlap with each other. There is no interdigitation of pieces. The pe a typical piece would be shaped like that. Oh, that one's bright red. And if you think about it for a while, why do I have a bright red piece? 
Well, the puzzle is called farmyard, and you realize that must be, for example, the barn roof. You can't tell, because there's another reason these puzzles are hard. They don't come with a picture. And assembling them can be quite tricky, especially if some of the assembly... Well, here is the goose whose head is under the edge of the barn, as seen from the perspective of the viewer. But the only place where the two contact is this very short, straight edge. And you have to make the contact by being clever. These are very difficult puzzles, uh, as jigsaw puzzle aficionados will be happy to tell you. A more traditional puzzle, though, is the um, dungeon adventure, this go, especially if we go back a period in time, and there are no random events. That is, you will have your encounter, and the computer announces a result, but there's actually no random number generator hiding in there. It's just, you will always encounter the demon, and if you are smart and carrying the sword of demon slaying, you will always kill the demon, and otherwise, the demon needed a nice lunch, didn't he? Um, puzzles that are finite state machines with hmm, no, no hidden information, so you always know what you're facing, you always know what's going on. If you have something that looks like a game, but it's finite state, it's really a maze. And all mazes are soluble. Now, there is a slight complication here is the world's simplest maze. Here is the target. Here are the uncrossable walls related to the target. You notice this maze is insoluble. There is no way to get to the destination. But it's a puzzle. It's just it has no answer. On the other hand, if there is a hole, there is an answer. And there are bunches of ways to deduce solutions to mazes. Uh, the traditional run your hand on the left wall or the right wall um, does not work necessarily quite as well as you would think because you can do clever things with levels going up and down. But a puzzle is something that it has a solution. You, go, you execute it. Once you know the solution, it's like a Rubik's Cube. But what is the fastest, world's fastest solution to the Rubik's Cube? Six cans of colored spray paint. It works every time, and it can be done very quickly. OK, so that's a puzzle. It's not a game, because there's no chance of losing. What about toys? Well, we could talk about computer toys like SimCity or Second Life. And the issue that Kostikian raises is that there is no goal. There are also more traditional toys. Tinker toys. In tinker toys, or American plastic bricks, they're sort of like Legos, but they don't stick to each other. They're, you could say they're a precursor to Legos, but they're actually superior as a child's toy. There can be objectives. You are trying to synthesize this object or that object. Now with Tinker Toys, if you look carefully, it is almost never the case that there can be a problem in assembly. In principle, there could be, because you could have something where you have to assemble part A and then drop part B over the top. And if you try to do it in the reverse order, nothing happens. I could, however, propose, OK, we have Tinker Toys. I am going to give you a challenge. Tinker Toys rotate. They're moving parts. They can float, hang left, down, or whatever. So we have something with moving parts. Your mission in life is to take a huge pile of Tinker Toys and use them to build a Turing machine, a general purpose computer. It's been done. It's in the Boston Computer Museum. 
It is not the world's fastest computer. Uh, the CPU, however, is oh, a quarter the size of this room. It has one of the largest CPUs you are likely to see unless you see one of these um, petaflop machines someday. But it's, that's still, it's a toy. You do things with it. Some of the toys can be quite challenging. The American plastic bricks um, allow you to build cantilevered structures, though the original people who had the designed the game didn't exploit this very much. And if you are assembling a cantilevered structure, you have to think about what you're doing, or you have the same problem as the um, famous house over the waterfall, Frank Lloyd Wright house, namely, uh, the material is overstressed, and at some point there will be a tip and things will fall over. You have to think about how you're building things to get the links in or the gadget will collapse. But it's still a puzzle and a toy. You do things with it. It's not a game. It's not something you play against someone else. Oh yes, story. A traditional story starts at point A and goes to point B and goes to point C and goes to point D. And what happens in between depends on the genre, the author, uh, the tolerance of the readers for utter points of utter boredom. There are all sorts of things you can put into stories that are not the same. Um, but there is the story. Um, it doesn't branch, it doesn't do anything. However, you can do stories that are not this simple minded. There is the choose your own adventure. In which, as you march along, there are places where you have branching. And therefore, at some point, you can do choice A and go to page 37, or choice B and go to page 82. And the consequences and the rest of the story change depending on your choice. The very first text adventure with branching, Brian Moriarty just figured this out after borrowing mine, was not, however, Choose Your Own Adventure. It was 22 years late, earlier. It was a 1950, we believe, five computer game for the Brainiac, the world's first home computer. You may actually get to see it at some point, since I own one. Um, and the Brainiac actually had a branching text adventure with competition and all these interesting pieces which you would not simply expect of a gadget that has a rather small number of moving parts, like six. Okay, but stories are not the same as games. They happen. You march at point one and put to point two. Now you can imagine things that appear to be games or not. Is Dungeons and Dragons a game? We'll do hands. One finger for yes, two fingers for no. Hands is Dungeons and Dragons a game. And I seem to see more or less unanimous agreement that it is a game. Uh, however, we are going to walk into a 1974 killer dungeon. And you walk into the dungeon, and there are three doors. And if you do open the first door, the outcome is Trap, no saving throw, instant death. And if you open door B, the choice out outcome is trap, no saving throw, instant death. And if you open door C, does anyone want to guess what door C is? Trap, no saving throw, instant death. Well, there's no competition, there's no branching. Uh, there is, however, a correct move. It is the same move that you would follow correctly on the old Hell's Gate dungeon. This was created, this goes back a long ways, of which it was said you could emerge with 6,000 gold pieces, two levels, and four magic items if you went in with 50,000 gold pieces, 10 levels, and 100 magic items. And the solution is 
don't go in. That, well, it's a game, sort of, but it's sort of one direction, one outcome. Um, another example, we'll take another example of a story. This is a motion picture. And in a certain sense, it's a story, because if you watch the film four times, the whole film, the same things happen. However, it's a story, it's a, in a certain sense, a murder mystery with several witnesses, a substantial number of whom are lying. And so, depending on how, what you think, who is telling the truth, and who is fibbing, and who at the end is explaining what actually happened, or is lying to confuse matters for some reason, my, there are several different realities in there, aren't there? Um, there is an old Gordon Dixon novel, The Man in the High Tower. How many of you have read it? Oh. Well, the hero either does, time tra does travel across time into our universe, or has a very strange dream. Choose one. You can easily justify either from what the author said. Uh, oh yes, story. This is also a picture of bottom end D and D module design, where the games master is told, no matter what, at the end of these events, the players will reach point A at midnight. Well, this is called script immunity, and in a badly conceived set of events, even the script immunities have script immunity, and it's not a game. It's a story. The games master is talking, and the players actually, the actions may look impressive, but actually have no consequences. They're like my original dungeon, choose A, choose B, or choose C. So we've now talked about a bunch of things that games are not. So the question is, what is a game? And the answer, the Greg Kostikian advances is that a game has certain features. It has participants. There has to actually be something there. There have to be goals. There have to be choices that actually affect the outcome as opposed to my ABC dungeon. I guess that's choices with meaning, as opposed to pointless choices. What else do we need? Opposition. Decision making. Okay. So there are a bunch of things. Oh, I should probably toss in. It's related to choices. Resource management. And these are features that real games have. Real games have people involved that are doing things. Now, of course, there's a complicated, I have to be a little careful on that, because there are also solitaire games. Uh, there are traditional solitaire card games. Uh, you might say, well, those are finite state machines because if the cards are on the board in some order, there are, if you tell me what all the locations are, there are at best 52 factorial. I admit it's a large number, but it is finite. 52 factorial games, and therefore, gee, that's what there is. However, if, if the cards are face down, it isn't a maze because you don't know what cards you're looking at and therefore the solution is not as simple as saying this is a maze, I can generate a rule that for sure gives me a solution. If the cards are in the wrong place, I do not win. So there are solitaire games. There are also goals. And the goals are the victory conditions. Hmm. 
Let us go back. I will go back to first edition D and D. The later ones keep changing, and we ask if you read the actual rules. What are the victory conditions? How do I win Dungeons and Dragons? There aren't any. The original rules were very clear on that. Because you are playing characters, and it's like history. History does not end. You have a piece in history, and you start out here, and you go there. And most of us were born at some point, maybe in prehistoric times. And it, the reasonable expectation, despite modern medicine, is that most of us are going to die. So we have a participatory thread in history. And the Norns have woven it in here, and we'll snip our threads out here someplace. But history is not a game, because it does not, in the normal sense, have victory conditions, except the ones you choose for yourself. Now, if you are um, a soldier in some idiot dictator's army, the goal may be, I will choose to obey orders, because it's an improvement over being shot or boiled in oil or used for target practice. But there aren't victory conditions. Well, of course, there is one victory condition. He who dies with the most toys wins. However, there aren't victory conditions in life. There aren't victory conditions per se in Dungeons and Dragons. And therefore, I have now asked the question, is Dungeons and Dragons really a game in this sense? Because it wasn't designed to do this. Um, if you have a module, you may be told what the victory conditions are. The players will kill the unpleasant um, uh, creature, or they will be used for lunch. And in, that, and in the module, you may be told you win if you kill the creature. Otherwise, you lose. You're going to be used for snacks. Yes? So they're goals. Choices with meaning. What you do in the game has to matter. And that leads to an interesting question. Candyland, which some of you may not know, it's a die rolling game with little children. And you have a set of tracks, and you roll dice, and the pawns advance along the tracks. And the first pawn to get across the finish line wins. But the only way thing you can do is to roll the dice and count the spaces. And all tracks are exactly the same length. Let's think about this. Is Candyland a game in Kostikian sense? Yes, no. Think, hands. And I seem to see pretty much, well, not quite perfect agreement. There are a few people who are saying, yes, it really is a game. Um, certainly, it's sold as a game, isn't it? And if you are four, you think it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I recall when I was about four and had learned how to count, carefully counting the length of each of the tracks in one of these games to find which one was the shortest. They were all the same length. That's very sad. <laughs> OK. Opposition. You are trying to move to some goal, and something is pushing back. Well, that leads to an interesting point. If you're playing in Dungeons and Dragons, it may be it's a module, and you are going to enter the cave and kill the monster. I mean, you have D100 swords that never miss, and the monster is a one hit point frog that cannot move. This, yes, this is not very competitive, but you have an objective, and it has opposition. It can make noises to frighten you. Well, if you think can be frightened by the game's master, go burp, burp, burp. Um, how is this different? How is a game that does not specify goals different from Sim City or Second Life? In those, you have to choose your own goals. 
Now, in Second Life, you can interact with other people. Uh, in the Sim City original version, Once Upon a Time, it was basically a solitaire game. Um, what is the difference? Or if I give, this is small children you're training to have imaginations, we hand over American plastic bricks or Lincoln logs, those are still sold, or Legos, well Legos aren't as good for this, and I say build a castle, yes? Or encourage the kid to build a castle and see what happens. Well, there is a goal, the resistance is gravity, they fall down. And after a while, you figure out that if you want the base wider than the top, the castle shaped like this may look impressive, but it's mechanically unstable. I promise it is, really. The uh, pile of blocks that goes up like this to a height as high as I can reach, well, I was a bit shorter at the time, will fall over and get noisy. Um, in any event, the issue is, well, there's a little fuzziness here as to what is a game and what is not. And am I allowed to choose my own goals? Well, that's what life, real life does. Okay. Item in game, resource management. But that leads to a problem. What are resources? Well, if you're playing space empires, there are minerals and radioactives and food. Uh, if you are playing Puerto Rico, there are the quarries, there are the plantations, there are the uh, buildings, there are the roll cards. Um, in a certain sense, the money and victory, well, victory points aren't exactly a resource. You can't do anything with them. But you can do things with money, especially in the clever variant, where you can pay off the person with the roll card to do things for you, or where you can buy or sell resources. Yes? So there is a variant, and the resources are the things you can make decisions about. So if you are playing chess, you have 16 pieces. Those are resources. You also have position which is a resource. Uh, there is a famous game in which uh, the, I, the name will come to mind in a moment, the greatest American chess player of the 19th century sacri moves his queen and the enemy takes it. And then he moves a, a rook, the enemy takes that. And then he moves a bishop and something else. And then he makes his last move and thanks to having thrown away a whole pile of his resources for positional re return, checkmate, he wins. It's very clever. Um, resources can also be more abstract position. If you play Go, there is something called outward influence. And the notion of outward influence is here you have a group of stones in some rational position and suddenly you place something out here. And sort of all by its lonesome, but not that much by its lonesome. What have you just done? In essence, you have staked a claim on an area, and because you have a stone already there to reinforce your future moves, that move creates opportunities for you that you did not have without it. Oper um, outward influence, which can be very subtle, is a very powerful tool for winning Go games. Uh, it's certainly more powerful than some other techniques that completely incompetent players like me use. Um, so there is a resource. Oh yes, things you might have. Tokens. Tokens are like computer memory or paper and pencil. Tokens are there to keep track of what is going on. Now I might ask, do I have to have tokens in order to play a game? One finger for yes, two fingers for no. If you're thinking of scissor, papers, rocks, your hand is a token. It is recording what your decision was on your move.
Does anyone wish to cite an example of a tokenless game with deep strategy? How many of you have heard of chess hands? Good. How many of you have ever heard of blindfold chess, where the two players do not see the board? Blindfold chess, there are no tokens. You are playing against your opponent, and I will be sitting here, and I will say, uh, pawn A4, and my opponent will say something, and I will say, rook A3. Um, some of you may be a little alarmed by what my opening is, but those of you who know chess notation know what my first two moves look like. Uh, in any event, the core issue is it's a tokenless game. Now, you might have a referee who is making the move, so if you don't agree with each other, you can find out what the position was. But a tokenless game. Nonetheless, almost all games have tokens. Oh, yes. Something we could call information. That is, we're making decisions about resources, but in order to make decisions about resources, you have to have a rationale for making those decisions. If I am playing, let's do Puerto Rico. I am currently five points behind the leader, but I have a stack of cash and one move. And if I am the last person in the round to move, I may be able to grab one of those two space buildings worth 10 points and drop it and its human being, colonist, in place, or at least it in place. And if I have done things just right, because I have the information, this is the last move, I make that move and I win. On the other hand, if my information is it we're about the second or third round of the game, and most people have a couple of plantations and maybe a quarry and a production plant, grabbing a two-space building that does nothing for me, the same building. Everything is the same, but we're way early in the game. The turn in number is, or at least where we are in the game, is information. It's a fact you use to decide whether or not to make a particular move. That's what information is. Oh, so that's sort of what makes a game, according to Greg Kostikian. And I've emphasized points where what he says is a bit fuzzy. That is, yes, those are the things that make a game, but you should realize that there are edges out there. He suggests a few other things. I'm going to suggest a particular one, visible rules. If I know what the rules of the game are, I can do deep analysis. If I don't know what the rules of the game are, I can't. In many computer games, the rules are hidden from the players, and you sort of have to guess, well, what do I do to persuade the gun to shoot? Preferably before the dragon has me for breakfast. And uh, there are all sorts of amusing possibilities. Press one key, press two keys at the same time, um, turn the monitor on and off, off and on. That's a clever one. Most people will never think of that one. You turn the monitor off and on. Now the dragon thinks it's night and goes to sleep. And now you can cut its throat. That was a clever one, wasn't it? But if you have visible rules, like in chess or Go, or the game we're go board, hex encounter board war game we're going to look at, Stalingrad, you can do deep analysis. Um, variety of encounters, also known as weak unpredictability. You aren't necessarily going to know what's ha going to happen. Now, if you're playing against a human opponent, the opponent supplies the weak unpredictability. Uh, it is the, if you are playing against uh, the great Japanese Go player Shusaku, in, the, in which he makes the immortal move. Stone, he appeared to be in really deep trouble. Stone drops down, and this why, 
and suddenly it's apparent the whole game is turned around. Well, in principle, there are only about 150 locations where he could have played, and therefore, in principle, you could have analyzed all 150 of them. It's a finite state game. But you couldn't actually do that, and therefore, there's weak unpredictability. You don't know what clever thing your opponent will do. Or in traditional D&D, we're going to have a random encounter. I will roll dice. And you will run into a party of travelers, a dragon, or the most dangerous of all opponents, a small group of men, most of whom will immediately kill you. Um, weak unpredictability, oh yes. Well, some weak unpredictability is better than others. Balance, interest, all sides. Uh, you recall the D and D event. D one sword of D one hundred never misses. Does D one hundred of damage. One hit point frog. What is the interest in playing the frog? Well, there isn't any. It doesn't have a chance, right? But there's an exception to this. And the exception requires that the frog player do something creative. The famous example of this, which does not involve frogs, is the tale of a hundred knights and a knight, in which this fellow is uh, this woman. No, it's not a fellow. It's one of, one of the women from the Seraglio, realizes that unpleasant things are going to happen. So she tells a story, but it's a cliffhanger. We repeat cliffhanger time and time and time again, and therefore, it is never the ultimate bad one night stand in which the uh, <clears throat> victim has their head chopped off at the end. It goes on and on and on, and at the end, there is an escape. Yes? And maybe it's actually a tale of a thousand nights in a night. That's the Burton translation. Uh, which some of you should realize is definitely not Victorian, gentle, bowdlerized. It's quite explicit. Um, in any event, you see, there it was a strategy for the frog. The frog has to do something to distract your attention from killing it. Uh, the other classic tale was the Greek prisoner in the court of the emperor of Persia. And the Greek prisoner promised I will teach your horse how to sing, give me a year. And halfway through, someone asked, this is absurd. His answer, well, maybe I'll die. Maybe the king will die. <clears throat> maybe I will teach the horse how to sing, but you notice I'm still alive. OK, so a few other things. Add-ons known as game supplements. In computers, they're sometimes called patches. Diplomacy. If you think back to Carcassonne, the very it's with visible hand where you negotiated, essentially everyone agreed were much better than the variations where you had hidden hands and there was no player interaction. OK. Color, chrome. How many of you have played Settlers of Catan, Hands? OK, a whole pile of you. Those of you who have, in addition to the cardboard game, there is a very expensive 3D plastic game with gorgeous pieces for everything. That's Chrome. It does not change the game at all, but it's really pretty to look at. Simulation. I'm not going to make a distinction here between Sirius and Chrome. And I will talk about board war games briefly. If I do a board war game on, say, the Battle of Gettysburg, or the Battle of Tyrejong, or the Battle of Sekigahara, we could go on, there are a whole pile of battles out there. Uh, I could do a game in which 
we attempt to duplicate everything as carefully as possible, and the players try to see if they could do better than the original commanders did, knowing that the game will behave exactly as the real armies did. I could also do a game in which the chrome is sort of layered on somewhat more deeply than in, say, Puerto Rico or Carcassonne, but in which it really is a game and there's no claim that this exactly resembles the real, or even much resembles the real battle. So there's simulation. Uh, what else? Hmm, we can ask other things here. How about character identification? Character identification is what made Dungeons and Dragons so alluring when it first came out. Because classic period board games and miniatures, you push the pieces over the board or the toy soldiers over the board, but no one in their right mind thought they were actually the Emperor Napoleon. Uh, it just what didn't make sense. With D&D, &D, in a certain sense, you became and tried to act out your character in one deep form of playing the game. It was about role playing and the fact that you were doing other things were to the side. Uh, let's see, narrative tension. Um, narrative tension, um, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to win. The opposite of narrative tension is a slippery slope. If you play civ classic civilization, the player who gets a space ahead at some point, uh, everyone else is in deep trouble because it's really hard to affect that one space advantage, even if it happened very early in the game. And so you were going to play for a long time in order to validate what you already knew was going to happen. That's the opposite of narrative tension. Okay. Let's see, what else can we talk about? Well, there are other reasons why people play games. Socialization. And I'm, in order to do that, I'm going to pop ahead to one of the problems you're in principle still working on, which is Glenn Blackow on why people play role games. Um, a few of you hypothetically will have access either to Alarms and Excursions or The Wild Hunt and be able to find his original article. But what were his reasons anyhow? And one reason was role playing. That is, the reason you play is to be the character and to develop the character over a long series of adventures. This does not work well if the adventures all include killer dungeons. Another reason you might play is storytelling, that is, things are going on, and you basically get to watch the games master tell a story. A storytelling is supported by script immunity, in which it only appears that you can change the outcome. Um, there is also wargaming, in which we have a party, the dungeon, the dungeon master has a whole pile of opposition, and if we are clever, we beat it. Wargaming and tactical skill matters. There was the famous TSR dungeon, dungeon entrance, and the local players who were actually higher level than was supposed to be necessary, had tried repeatedly to get into the dungeon and been butchered at the front door by the somewhat feeble doorkeeper every single time. And the acquaintance who then showed up and demonstrated tactics, they went through the dungeon. And the dungeon master kept saying, not fair, not fair. You can't do that. Sure, it's in the rules. It's in the module. And they wiped out the entire stronghold. And several player characters did lose a hit point or two. That's wargaming. It's tactics. Some people think that's important. I could also add social gaming, where, yes, we are playing a game, but we're also there to enjoy my brownie recipes, which um, uh, you don't. They're perfectly good, normal chocolate brownies that do not contain college student tobacco. <laughs> um, but the point of the social gaming is that you're there to meet people and talk, and the game is sort of secondary. 
Oh, yes. Uh, as some people have noted, there is always the player who is there as the significant other and the notorious uh, button which read, I sleep with the games master. Some of you have heard this one. And this is on the other, some other players for some reason don't like this. But that's the way it is. Oh, yes. One more. Travel on. You get to make decisions. The point of the decisions matter, you're, say, traitors in a vast archipelago into which you've been transported by magic. But the important part of the game is that the games master can spin off descriptions of scenery and creatures and events, and it is like being in an extremely well-written Patricia McKillop novel, except it's all happening spontaneously. That's travelogue. Um, so I have gone through, I didn't go through all of them on purpose, what Greg Kostikian talked about games and why games are important and what is a game and what isn't. And I also point out, you know, it's very nice to say game, not game. Here is the infinitely sharp, bright line between them. And my message is, oh, that isn't quite as true as you would think. But it is still something to think about, because in closing, at some point, many of you will be doing game design projects. And here you are in your MQP at the start of term three, or for God help us, term four. And one of the faculty members supervising says, well, this is all very neat. But where is the game? There does not seem to be a game here. There are no decisions to make. There are no resources. Uh, there are no goals that actually you can affect. Where is the game? If you hear that, you should realize you are in deep trouble. However, I have run us out of time. At 7 o'clock, there is the lecture. Go there. Class dismissed. Have a good day.